Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Clinton. I'm the field CTO at Sneak, uh, which is pronounced like a pair of sneakers or sneaking around. Uh, it also is an acronym, stands for So Now You Know. So now you know that much at least. Uh, and hopefully at the end of uh, the next you know, 40 minutes or so, we'll all know a little bit more about this idea of shifting left. Uh, something near and dear to my heart, uh, having built software for uh, 20 odd years or so now. Um, now I talk about building software for a living, uh, which is you know quite a bit easier, I have to say. Um, so what we're going to do today is talk a little bit about this concept of shifting left, what sorts of things can be shifted, and, and frankly, as a follow-on to that, what sorts of things should maybe not be shifted left now that we're roughly you know, 10 years or so into this sort of uh, DevOps uh, type of, uh, of experiment. Um, the first thing to say, since the idea of shifting left isn't what you expected, is in the name of the session, uh, I might not be the person uh, you expected. This talk was originally supposed to be done by our colleague, uh, Shen Ri, who is the co-founder of Enzo Security. Uh, lives in Tel Aviv, not the easiest place to get a flight out of these days. I live in Prince George's County, Maryland, about 20 minutes away, so you know by default you get uh, the, the local guy here. Um, that said, I'm going to try to do justice to a lot of Chen's uh, thinking around shifting left because, again, as a former developer, DevOps engineer and, and leader of developers. These concepts are sort of very near and, uh, and dear to my heart as well. So what we're going to do today is start off talking about what was the original idea behind shifting left? Why did we think this was important? Uh, again, as part of that original sort of DevOps uh, evolution that we started about you know, 10 years or so ago. What were the reasons uh, why we embarked on that? How were some of those transformations made? And then fast forward to today. What does shifting left look like now uh, when we look at the responsibilities that are put on developers? What is a day in the life of a developer of modern software? look like and how is that a little bit different than software used to uh, fundamentally be developed? Where have we maybe made some mistakes or could make some improvements uh, in the idea of what we shift into the developer workflow, uh, what we don't? I also want to draw this distinction between shifting left, which is fundamentally something, at least for me, that's related to the idea of developer experience, like how do developers approach their day-to-day -day work and how can you meaningfully integrate uh, other kinds of tasks and processes into that work uh, versus what I'll call throwing left or the undifferentiated assignment of toilsome work to developers without thinking about how it fits in uh, to their workflow without thinking about the disruptions it causes uh, potentially to their experience. Um, and then what I assume maybe most people came for is this uh, key question here. Are we shifting the right things to the left? Uh, are we asking developers to uh, fundamentally help out with technical tasks that are compatible uh, with their day-to-day -day workflow? And surprise, surprise, I think the answer is going to be mm, probably not. There are potentially some improvements uh, that we could make. And then we'll talk about what other types of things could we shift to the left that we are not today that might actually help us with some of the areas where there has been maybe significant uh, friction, I'll call it, uh, in integrating into developer workflows. And then I'll leave some time at Q&A at the end. I think we've got about 40 minutes here. I don't plan to talk nearly that long, so hopefully we can create a little conversation around uh, some of these uh, issues related to shift left. All right, um, so to start with, I'm gonna show you a slide nobody has ever seen before in history. My clicker works, DevOps, right? <laughs> I personally have never understood what it means to shift left on an infinite loop, right? Um, so fundamentally, we've already got kind of a breakage in this concept here, right? We have this idea that software is, as opposed to a very structured waterfall process of being designed and then built and then tested and then deployed and then operated, uh, we move into this area where you know it's always all of those things all at the same time and we have rapid, agile, iterative cycles, blah, blah, blah. Um, so then we apply the concept of like, well, what should developers be responsible for and not, which fundamentally causes us to like disintertwine this. And then we end up with, you know, surprise, surprise, the sort of uh, original like waterfall diagram just with the word DevOps and, and a kind of stick in the middle. Um, again, I don't think this is necessarily the best metaphor to convey the idea of how you integrate something into the process of software development, right? Um, but the idea originally was something like this. If you can take steps that used to belong to the operation side of the equation that caused a great deal of friction because the operators of software were unfamiliar with the particular proclivities of every application and you made developers responsible for those tasks instead, that would remove friction, right? Probably not news to anyone in the room. So what kinds of things were originally considered as part of this equation, right? Well, we have to think back to what were some of the original points of friction that instantiated this whole movement toward DevOps. Um, 
And if we think back to those of us in the room who are maybe a little bit older, uh, we can you know, readily remember a world where it was actually really hard to deploy software, right? Why? Because you had to send it over the proverbial fence to people who didn't understand what your application was designed to do. And you could only do this roughly like once every few months, right? Because you'd say, all right, everything works in my laptop. It works on our developer environment. We've now SSH'd it up to the server that you run, and nothing works there. Why? Well, we have to have a call about it. And on that call, everybody blames each other, by the way, right? Because it's definitely not an operations problem because it worked on my machine and from the you know, ops guy's perspective. And I say guys is a very you know, sort of gender neutral term for people with beards who work in the basement. Um, they say, well, look, our environment is perfectly secure. It's perfectly operational. It's an application problem, right? So then there had to be another meeting of those people's bosses to talk about who was to blame, right? So the entire process of deploying software was just constantly fraught with these arguments because there was no agreed upon source of truth about you know, what would happen to that piece of software once it got deployed. Everybody wanted it to work, but there were just very different understandings of sort of what that concept meant. So when we think about what can be shifted left, and if we kind of uh, boil down that traditional diagram to maybe three phases, right? What do you need to have software that works? Well, you need to build it, you need to verify that it works correctly, and then you need to operate it at scale, right? The create part's easy. That should hopefully be on the left to begin with. Like if you have people in your server room building software, um, I don't know, that probably doesn't work out very well for, for mostly anyone. But the validate and the operate stages are actually where you can see real value here, right? In terms of validation, uh, things like unit testing, like functional testing, does the application do what we think it's going to do, can be part of uh, the developer workflow. And we'll talk about some of the successes and maybe challenges uh, in shifting some of those things. Security testing, surprise, surprise, is not going to be as clear cut of a story, and we'll go into some of the specific challenges there. But when we think about everything else involved in operation, right, we think about things like packaging of software and containerization, the configuration that that piece of software needs to avoid a lot of those meetings where everybody's bosses have to get involved and yell at each other about, you know, like whether a particular, in that case, XML file was uploaded to the right place or not. Um, the infrastructure that the software needs, right, as opposed to a bunch of manual processes where you say, here's how much compute I need. How much compute do you need? That's more than we have available, so then you have to put in a purchase order and then procurement gets involved, right? So like a month's long process to even get a server requisition, as opposed to today's world where what does a developer do? They write a couple lines in a YAML file and they've got the resources that they need. Even identity and access, right? Software now defines the roles and permissions that it takes on, and developers are the ones who are you know, writing that as code. Things like attribution, which we'll talk about a little bit later as well. So lots of things can uh, be shifted left, but then we look at kind of how that has evolved, right? What sorts of things do we now expect developers to do as part of their day-to-day -day tasks, which by the way, are all above and beyond the act of actually building software that works. Um, so let's talk about the first the why and the how, right? Why did we decide to shift left originally and then how uh, do we go about that process? Um, the why, again, I think pretty obvious here, right? All software is code. So the people who write that software should have some say in managing how it's operated because they know it best. And how should they do that? Well, so they should do it through code because that's how you're gonna be uh, able to get efficiency out of automation. Um, and of course, there's the massive financial component here, right? Work is always cheaper than rework. If you are making assumptions about how a piece of software is gonna operate in production, and then those turn out to not be correct, you have to go back and not only fix the thing that turned out to be the incorrect assumption, but then all of the work that you did that depended on that thing, right? Uh, and I like to say that developers fundamentally, yeah, okay, we're sort of lazy people, but it's not that we're against doing work. We're very much against doing rework, right? Because that's actually fixing the problem at the most expensive point in the process rather than the cheapest, which is when you're building something for the first time. Um, and then this idea that like, look, if you're driving at night, you should probably put your headlights on, right? So as opposed to finding out there's an obstacle when you hit it, you should find out when you see it in front of you so that you can then take steps to avoid it. That's gonna be you know, much cheaper, much easier, much less frictionful along uh, a number of dimensions. So how do we shift left, right? Well, I think for me, it boils down to sort of three core principles. Um, the first is automation of processes that can be made reliable. 
right? Something like copying files to a server is probably not something that someone should be doing by like clicking and dragging something over. You can make a lot of mistakes with your fingers. You can make a lot of mistakes with your brain. And if you've got human processes doing things over and over, which should be mechanical, repeatable processes, those are things that we should be able to use software to automate. But that requires a couple of additional pieces here, right? First of all, your operations team has to be a little bit agnostic about some of those decisions that developers are making. Uh, they can't say that, well, we are only going to host you know, PHP applications, so you have to rewrite all of your Python code in, in PHP. So shout out to the PHP devs in the room here. Um, so ops has to be agnostic on one level. They have to be able to accept a diversity of technical input of these applications that want to be run in production. But they also have to be opinionated. And this is where a lot of, I think, the shift left thinking can fail, is what is that line between agnosticism in terms of the tech stack and being opinionated in terms of this is what we will allow to run in our production environment. But the final piece here is on the developer side, and that is let those developers self-serve. Right? As engineers, we want a technical solution to a problem. We especially want that instead of a human solution to a problem. So we want to be able to write the YAML file. We want to be able to declare in code what our service or application needs and then have that be accepted by that production environment once that's actually deployed. So if you get these three things, you've got the automation, you've got a roughly agnostic operations team that no longer has to care about you know, each individual special snowflake application, but they just have to care about running a platform, for example. And then within that platform, there's a series of choices that developers can make, right? And they can declare those in code, that can go through the automated process. More or less, you're satisfying these three goals, right? You're recognizing all software as code, you're doing work instead of rework, and instead of hitting those obstacles as part of the validation and operation cycle, you're ideally being able to kind of see them uh, in front of you. Uh, and this is why everybody came to this talk, right? To say that we've solved the shift left problem, and we can all go home now because you know we're so happy. Um, Unfortunately, this isn't exactly how it's worked uh, in practice, right? Because in addition to shifting left the things that might be sort of obvious, there's a whole bunch of other things that a developer is now responsible for. Like, obviously the deployment piece, but in addition, like, how are those services monitored in production? What does the alerting look like? Um, what are the backups and disaster recovery and business continuity strategy of those applications? Um, how are they logged? Um, how are they scaled? What are some of the considerations around capacity planning? Cost management in the cloud is something that now increasingly is a developer responsibility, right? And in addition to all of that, they actually have to build software. So I fundamentally argue that like this is a lot and you're asking the people in the organization who are in the critical path for innovation to actually make it to market to do all of these things. So this is where I would begin to draw the distinction, right, between sort of shifting left and throwing. Just because a developer can take responsibility for something doesn't necessarily mean that they should or that that is the best outcome in terms of how you're dividing up responsibility within an organization. Remember, ops should be agnostic but also opinionated. It's a security conference, so I don't think anybody should say that, you know, developers should make all relevant decisions about risk in, in an organization, right? That's why there's a security department. That's why the business decides on the risk that it wants to incorporate in its software. And ultimately, developers should be able to consume that risk profile and make better decisions about what goes into their applications. So, Something about this hasn't fundamentally worked, right? We've shifted a lot to the left, but we still have these frictionful issues, and we still have this disclarity of ownership or responsibility between developers on the left and between the operations and security teams on the right. Um, but let's talk about first what's worked, right? Because there actually are some real success stories uh, around shift left. And I think maybe the biggest one is the way software is packaged, right? You go back even 10 years ago, and this was fundamentally a big issue because you had to, again, requisition a server to run it on. It had to be a particular operating system to support the underlying technology of the application. You had to put a big list of requirements in terms of runtimes and frameworks and libraries and dependencies that had to be installed on that server. And that was a manual process that took months to actually get procured and set up. And then, of course, by the time you deployed it, nothing worked, right? Because technology is really complicated, especially when you're dealing with manual and human-oriented processes. But enter the container. The container is fundamentally, I think, the biggest success story of shifting left, right? Because now the developer decides 
everything that goes into the unit of delivery of software, right? It's no longer an arbitrary thing. And I really think the metaphor of you know, international shipping plays really well here, right? The people unloading and loading the, the ships no longer have to know whether that ship contains like liquid or dry goods or things that require refrigeration, for example. The individual requirements of the cargo now go inside the container. So therefore, you can automate that process, right? Because the people who are unloading the containers don't have to know what's inside. And the people who are packing them only have to know about the requirements of that individual piece of cargo. So it's a great story. We shift software packaging to the left, and everybody is happier because the operators of software only, know, have, to, only have to know how to support one thing, Kubernetes, right? Anything that can run on Kubernetes, which is fundamentally any unit of software, is going to run happily on that cluster because we've agreed on a set of context that the developers have access to, right? I can write a YAML file for a deployment, and that means I define how many CPU cycles do I need, how many gigabytes of RAM, uh, what kind of networking do I need to exist in that environment, what services does my service need to connect to, and so forth and so on, what roles and permissions do I need, and uh, the, the, the workflow simply works as it's designed to do, right? All of that gets created in an automated way without me having to put in a support ticket for someone in operations because I want to run a Python app instead of, you know, something written in PHP or in .NET. Um, infrastructure as code is another really good example of this, right? Maybe not quite the adoption level of, uh, of containers, but definitely getting there. Because now, in addition to saying, here's the, uh, the requirements, the dependencies that my piece of software needs, I also get to say, here's how I want it to behave, right? Here's how I want it to interact with other software. These are the cloud resources that it needs to be able to access. And I can do all of that from my place over here on the left inside my developer workflow, right? So inside my Git repo with YAML files that sit alongside everything else that I'm doing. Um, and the third one, and there might be a little disagreement here, but I would actually say unit testing counts as a shift left success story, right? Because if as a developer I know because of automated processes that every uh, atomic component of my software is working as expected, that is an entire tranche of potential issues that I don't have to worry about in production. Right? And this varies a little bit based on ecosystem, but by and large, if you're writing in a sort of language that supports unit testing, I think it's fairly well adopted within organizations, pays obvious benefit. And again, people on the operation side, they don't have to worry about it, right? All that matters is you press the button that says run the unit test, and if they fail, the deployment doesn't, doesn't go through. And if they succeed, you can be reasonably confident that if, not that there's not a problem in that application, but if there is, it comes from a much more complicated place than like somebody forgot to put a curly brace, you know, somewhere in the code. So what do these three things have in common? Um, I would say all of them are sustainable efforts for developers, right? Again, to take containerization as an example. It is un sort of unfathomably easy to containerize an application, right? I write two lines of code. I say from, and then I just name the technology that I want to build it on top of. And then I say copy dot to slash, right? So like take everything in my working directory and put it in the container, and then I run a build. And then I've got this unit of software that runs anywhere, right? That's a very sustainable developer effort. If you're saying that to deploy anything anywhere, you have to write two additional lines of code and put it in something called a Docker file in your repo, I'm signing up for that as an engineer. Infrastructure as code, fairly similar, right? Like there's lots of documentation around how to self-serve for a developer to build the kinds of infra that we need. Um, unit testing, again, if you're following any sort of test-driven development, type of, uh, of philosophy in your organization, you should actually be writing the tests first before you're writing the code that satisfies the tests. So again, all of these have a very sustainable effort from the developer perspective. There's not like a hockey stick curve in terms of the impact or the investment needed from development teams. Additionally, all three have a really high impact on velocity, right? Like containerization enables you know, a bunch of people to no longer have to worry about how to support individual technologies at the service level. Instead, they can just focus on how to scale that out in the cloud. There's an entire series of concerns that no longer um, you know, even require human decisions to be made. All of that can be automated. And same thing for unit testing. You're no longer tracking down kind of uh, individual logic errors or even things like parse errors inside your applications. That gets caught further to the left and it avoids a lot of deployments that otherwise would have exploded you know, in much more dangerous places. So you combine those, you combine sustainable developer effort, high impact on velocity to the organization. What do you get? You get standards, 
right? More or less everyone's containerizing their software, fewer but a high degree of, uh, of acceleration toward universal use of infrastructure as code and unit testing kind of the standard for like don't do dumb stuff uh, when you're writing code. But the additional piece all these three have in common is there's actually no real challengers on the right. You think like if developers didn't do unit testing on the left, what would happen? Like probably bad stuff, right? There's no actual way to say from production, can I verify at the unit level that every method in my application is working correctly? Like that doesn't even make any sense. The other two, yeah, sure, I guess there are people still racking and stacking their servers and they're big fans of you know, big metal down in the data center, but that's not a realistic competitor, right? When you say like, hey, instead of writing four lines of code to spin up all the resources you need in the cloud, go to this guy and he can procure a bunch of you know, hardware for you and he can have it installed by next month. There's no fundamental competition there, right? So this is almost the kind of third area where you have to look at to determine what is successful from a shift left front is what's competing with it on the right that maybe counts against some of the sustainability of the developer effort and the impact of velocity uh, that you're gonna see. All right, let's go kind of the, to the middle tier now. Um, we've talked about what's successful. Where's there maybe a little bit more difficulty in terms of shifting things left? Here's where I would say functional testing uh, takes a place. A lot of organizations have made this work, right? Um, I don't know anyone who's done it easily, right? Functional testing here, by which we mean kind of full integration testing of an application. Do all of the use cases from the user perspective get satisfied by that piece of software once it's actually deployed? Um, this is actually a pretty big upfront investment from every de uh, developer team in the organization, right? Because in addition to writing your unit tests, which are fairly straightforward and like little atomic quick bytes of code, integration tests are really complicated, right? Because you're actually trying to capture user behavior in software, which is possible, but it's hard, right? Because you have to say things like, as a user who's on the home page, when I click the about link, the about page should load, right? But then if somebody changes the URL of the about page, the functional test breaks and like there's a lot of headaches involved. So you have to invest in a functional testing framework. You have to train everyone on how to use it. You have to ensure 100% coverage against all your use cases, which means product people have to get involved. <clears throat> and uh, fundamentally, this impact varies pretty greatly based on the extent to which the ecosystem you're using supports easy functional testing, whether you're doing behavioral driven development. There's like lots of good prior art here. But this is a significant investment for an organization to make to say we're going to shift all of this to the left. Also, I'm going to introduce this idea of context, right? From a developer's perspective, the most expensive operation you can undertake is a context switch, meaning I'm in one environment and then I need to move to another to get some required information. And with functional testing is where we start to see additional required context, right? Because you need to understand not just what your piece of code is doing, but what the expectation of the user is who's interacting with it, right? I probably don't have that in front of me. I then have to go and look at the use case. I have to go look at the product documentation, bring that back and figure out how to write a functional test based on it, right? So it is possible to get that context, but it does require efforts. That counts against the kind of investment part of the criteria here. In addition, there is a very obvious challenger on the right, which is called manual QA, which every organization has been doing since the beginning of time, and most of them are still doing, precisely because it's really hard to shift functional testing all the way to the left. Like, even with organizations that say, we have 100% coverage of behavior-driven development, which, you know, applause to you if that's the case, you probably also still have somebody who's clicking the buttons in a staging environment to say, can we release this to customers without getting embarrassed? So this is kind of the middle area, right? Um, some orgs do this well, some do it more poorly, but there is a challenger um, that, you know, if you were to say to an organization, hey, no more functional testing shifted left, they say, okay, we're fine. We might have to hire a couple more QA people, but like, we'll get by. So let me get to the real elephant in the room, right? What fundamentally hasn't worked from a shift right perspective? That's right, security testing. Security testing is actually kind of, if you look at it from just an implementation perspective, quite easy, right? Because you turn on a bunch of tests in your pipeline or in your PR check and you say, are there vulnerabilities here, right? What does a developer get? A large volume of undifferentiated alerts. They have no idea what to fix. They have no idea how to fix it. They just know that now there's a big red mark on the screen that they're fundamentally going to have to address. Security testing from a developer perspective is fundamentally difficult to triage, prioritize, and manage within their workflow. Why is that? Because first of all, it's not naturally in their critical path, right? 
I can write a bunch of software as a developer and ship it all into production and my users can love it and I can get gold star reviews on all of my uh, kind of performance impacts. And that can be really insecure code, right? When do I discover that? Way after the fact. So someone has to put security in my critical path. So it's only synthetically involved in my day-to-day -day work as a developer. But the most important reason here why this is a huge investment and why you don't see velocity from it is that the needed context from the right is missing. And I can't actually create that even with sort of Herculean effort the way I can do it for functional testing. In addition, of course, there's tons of challengers on the right. You've got pen testing, you've got DAST, you've got bug bounties, right? Um, any you know, uh, security vendor that does a, uh, has a piece of scanning software that's not fundamentally focused on the developer has a solution here, and they'll be the first ones to tell you, yeah, shift left is kind of really hard to do, right? So with testing, from the security perspective, we're really stuck because we don't have the easy investment from a developer perspective. We don't have the proven velocity because actually almost you know, to 100%, security testing slows developers down. And then fundamentally, the approaches on the right, even though they are investments for an organization, I mean, they work, right? There's a reason that everyone does pen tests even if they have the best developer-facing security program in the world. All right. Let's talk about some of the reasons in particular that that is hazardous, right? We talked about how the effort required for triage exceeds the typical capacity of an application testing team, right? And, and uh, initially, this looks like a reason you would want to push stuff to the left, because you'd want to say, well, yeah, get the developers involved, have them do it, right? But again, they're overwhelmed by these undifferentiated alerts. They don't know what to fix. They don't have the context required to prioritize and triage issues because it's completely missing from their workflow. All they're getting is alerts. They're being told, this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong. And they're saying, well, within those, what is the worst one from an organizational risk perspective? And then what do I actually do about it? That's missing from all of these sort of security solutions that are designed for the developer workflows. That's how you antagonize developers, first of all, right? By giving them a bunch of things that are interrupting their workflow without enabling them to trust the source of those alerts or even sort of the validity of them. And because of that lacking single source of truth, you actually don't get the benefit from shifting left in the first place. Why? Because developer gets an alert saying, hey, we failed your build because the security issue failed. What do they do? They have to go to AppSec. They have to say, I'm sorry, can you tell me more about this? Like, why is this a risk? Why should I care? What are the mitigating controls I could think about? And then fundamentally, like, is this something I should fix first? And then again, what do I do? So you risk losing the buy-in from engineering, not just for this particular kind of testing, but for any security testing at all, because suddenly security is seen as fundamentally a force that slows you down, doesn't speed you up, and that's not where you want to be from a developer perspective. Um, I talked a lot about kind of context of application risk, and this, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into too uh, uh, sales pitchy of a, of a slide here, but I did just want to show this, at least how we at Sneak are thinking about this context that's required. Because there's a lot that goes into whether a vulnerability or an issue translates into a risk for the organization, right? What do most people look at? CVSS score. Is that sufficient to understand if your organization is going to be breached? Absolutely not, but because it's one of the only things that can be automated because it's a number, that's what most, most organizations still use as a security threshold, and that's very, very bad. Things like what environment is this going to? Does it actually make it to production? Does it get deployed? Once it gets deployed, is it public facing? What are the conditions that are required to exploit this vulnerability, and do they exist in the environment that it's going to? Uh, what's the maturity level of the exploits that are associated with it, right? There's a lot of critical vulnerabilities in the world, CVSS9, that have never been exploited. There's also a lot of CVSS5 vulnerabilities that get attacked every day because there are mature exploits available and anyone can download them in a matter of seconds and be running attacks against your application. Things like uh, lateral movement. Uh, I'll handle some questions maybe at the end if you don't mind. Um, once the attacker is able to exploit that, where else can they get? What's the network path look like? Um, what other damage can they do? Um, is the vulnerability actually reachable? Meaning like I might have an open source package that's got an issue, but am I actually calling the method, right? Is there a way into it? And then fundamentally, what's the business criticality, right? If that service is used to support like a marketing brochureware website versus the crown jewels of the organization, I probably want to think differently about how I want to fix it. So all of this context, and probably a lot more, is needed for a developer to understand what to fix. How much of this exists in the developer workflow? CVSS score, right? So like fundamentally, you're not getting the benefit from shifting left because of the lack of context from a developer perspective. 
So this comes back to the idea of shifting versus throwing, right? And I'll have kind of Jeff explain this, right? Just because a developer, just because you can make something a developer responsibility doesn't mean that you should. We've made so many things and we've almost turned DevOps into this meaningless term because we repeat it so much by saying that, oh yeah, shift left, shift left, shift left. We've stopped uh, thinking about whether it actually provides the velocity at a reasonable level of investment for those engineers. And we've almost completely stopped talking about what the trade-offs are, right? The availability of context and the domain knowledge to understand what vulnerabilities should I fix and when and why still sits within AppSec, even though we're shifting the testing portion of it to the left. So in a way, we've sort of done the worst possible uh, combination here, right? We've actually slowed developers down without giving them the information they need to make better decisions in the first place, because they're still ultimately making that round trip out to AppSec and then back. Um, and I've got this point in here, like, do your developers really like writing that much YAML? Really? No, but like, have you asked them how much they like writing YAML? Um, a little bit of a pet peeve of mine, right? Because just because something can be captured in code doesn't necessarily mean that it should be or if, that it's the first thing that ought to be captured in code because it might have dependencies on other things that don't exist, right? And as soon as you're trying to capture things like security testing and code, but you don't have some of the fundamental building blocks to understand that risk, like attribution and attestation, for example, you end up in a world of hurt. So again, uh, part of the initial justification for shifting left was this idea that toil existed on the right. And as long as we can enable developers to take more action earlier, we can limit that toil. But I fundamentally think what we're realizing here is that Toyo can live anywhere, right? And just because you can make it a developer responsibility doesn't mean that you're making their lives easier or ultimately even making the ops and security folks on the right lives easier by giving them a responsibility that they fundamentally don't have the context to adequately address. I love this quote. Uh, Andy Bergen in a book called All Around DevOps Nuisance. The harder things are to do that don't directly impact value to customers, the less likely they are to be prioritized. And I think this is the failure of basically every shift left security program summed up neatly in one sentence, right? Because risk is not something that you can adequately incentivize developers to take control of or to make an understanding of because they don't define the organization's risk posture. And because you don't give them the context to make better decisions, then ultimately you're sort of leaving them out in the cold, right? So what happens? Tickets end up in a backlog. And we say, we'll get to those next sprint, but like nobody believes that because you don't actually set aside sprints to deal with security. You're just hoping that you don't get bothered so that you can go on to work for, you know, the, the next thing, next piece of functionality you really want to build. Um, I throw this in here because, again, I care a lot about talking to developers and making their lives better. So when we think about shifting versus throwing, what fundamentally is the difference? And for me, it comes back to this idea of what does developer experience mean? And this is uh, a lot of research being done very recently. This uh, graphic comes from an issue of the uh, Association of Computer Manufacturers from earlier this year. They did a ton of research into what actually creates a good experience for a developer. And they basically come down to these three characteristics of any process, any tool, any kind of workflow from an engineer's perspective. And the first and arguably most important is this idea of flow state. Flow state's kind of a natural concept for those of us who might be really into a hobby or you're you know, really into working out or something. The idea is that your higher order brain functions are kind of disengaged because you're making so many decisions based on context you already have available. Right? Um, if I'm like doing a puzzle or playing a game that I've played a lot before, I don't have to stop and think about the rules. I know the rules, right? We refer to this as muscle memory a lot. It doesn't li really live in our muscles, it lives in our brain. But I like the idea, because I'm an engineer, of sort of warm cache, right? Like once you've built up that warm cache, making a series of decisions based on those rules is fundamentally very easy. What's hard is when you encounter a piece of information or that flow state is interrupted and you have to go sort of out of it and then back again. Remember we talked about context switching earlier, right? That is fundamentally the most expensive operation a developer can make because you've built up all of this context and then what happens, you get a security alert, you have to go do something else and then come back and the context isn't there anymore, right? You have to rebuild it back up. So a positive developer experience is created by allowing them to exist in their flow state without interrupting it. There's also this concept of feedback loops, right? The idea that um, I'm an engineer and I think people who've never built software have this idea that developers like sign into work, uh, you know, for, for a day, they get out their keyboard and they just type all day long, right? Um, I'm here to tell you that like most software developers type about 1% of the time. What they're doing with the other 99% is trying to figure out what to type. 
And that's because the act of building software is not one continuous motion. It's a series of iterative loops, right? Where I encounter a problem, I think of the a potential solution for it, I implement that solution, and what happens? I get a different error message, right? But I'm moving forward in my thought process, and if I can pack in enough of those iteration loops into my work time, I've actually gotten something done. But if I have to wait to get feedback, if I don't know the outcome, if I have to guess about the thing that I'm doing, uh, ultimately, that is what slows me down as a developer, because then I'm stuck. Then I'm just sitting around and I'm like sword fighting with my, uh, you know, my cube mate based on that XKCD comic strip from several years ago, because I'm just waiting for things to compile, right? Or I'm waiting for security to come back to me to tell me what vulnerability to fix. And the final one here is cognitive load. And this is the idea that if I don't already have the information available, I have to go out and acquire it. And again, that's a very expensive operation, right? So what does security get wrong about the developer experience? Well, all of it, right? It interrupts flow state because it tells you to focus on something else. It creates these vastly long feedback loops because you still have to make this round trip out to your AppSec team and then back in. And it fundamentally adds to cognitive load because you don't have all the information required to make a decision at the point where you need to make it. You actually have to wait. You have to acquire new information from multiple different sources, right? So when we think about shifting versus throwing, the shift left uh, uh, pieces that we looked at earlier that succeeded got this right because they were able to integrate meaningfully into the developer experience. The things that are thrown left instead violate these principles and that's where we've not seen success in integrating them into the developer workflow. Um, so basically all that I just said, I kind of tried to boil down here, right? What are some principles for more effective shifting left? Um, first of all, as an engineer, I have to say real change only happens when engineering says it does, right? There's no amount of like strongly worded memos that'll get them to integrate things in their workflow that don't natively belong there. Uh, shift only the things that enhance and not disrupt your developer experience. Does it enable shorter feedback loops, minimize cognitive load, maintain that flow state rather than interrupting developers? Focus on shifting the things left that actually create value on the right, as opposed to just saying, well, we can make developers do it, so we might as well, right? Actually have a story, understand what you expect to get out of that, as we saw with things like packaging and infrastructure as code. And then when possible, shift the context along with the responsibility. The problem with security testing is that we want to move the responsibility to the left without any of the context that enables better decisions to get made. Um, and then ultimately, for any shift left philosophy, and this is true whether you're building platforms internally, whether you're building security tools, whether you're de building developer processes, think about paved roads. Developers want to do the easy thing, and if you make the easy thing also the right thing, that is the thing that they'll do. But if you make the easy thing different from the right thing, you're going to ultimately be in a world of hurt, right? Because you're dealing with people that have very technical brains, that are under an immense amount of stress and whose incentives are probably not aligned with yours because their incentives are, we need to get these tickets pushed out into production by X date because we have to start our next sprint. And that has nothing to do with organizational risk or anything really people on the right tend to care about. So we talked about the principles for better shifting left. What are some things we could potentially shift left now as we work together to solve this broader problem uh, of, uh, of security testing? The first, and I think the one that could make the most impact, is attribution. Uh, there's a concept called code owners, right? It's a file that in theory should exist in every software repository in the world, and I think adoption is around like 9% or something like that. What do code owners do? Well, it actually fundamentally says, here's who is responsible for this service, here's how it connects to other things, and here's like the people that you need to you know, reach out to if something goes wrong. If code owners is introduced into a repository and then that piece of context is transferred out to the right, what do you have? Well, you have a piece of software with proper attribution once it exists in production. So when we think about providing value on the right, just by a simple like six line file in a repo, I can allow anybody operating that piece of software to understand where it came from and why it exists and like how to start the process of remediating a flaw that is huge from an AppSec perspective. I get a ton more value from understanding that than I do forcing these undifferentiated alerts on developers and saying like, go fix these things even though I can't tell you why or what to do about them. The second thing, and this is kind of an emerging space, but the idea of software lineage, understanding explicitly what facts led to the creation of a piece of software, right? And probably one of the first most well-known efforts in this space are SBOMs, right? 
we argue a lot. We're a security vendor. All of our competitors are out there. We talk about who does a better job of analyzing a piece of software to figure out what the SBOM is, right? But that's the wrong question. The question should be, how are we making it easier for developers on the left to introduce that SBOM into the software artifact as they're building it? Because that's ultimately the source of truth. But this can be expanded greatly, right? Like what if by looking at a software asset, I understood not just its open source dependencies, but every piece of technology that built it, the pipelines that it went through to get constructed, the underlying frameworks that it relies on, and all of that persisted until it reached the, ultimately the production environment. What that allows me to do as an operator is shift all the way to the left when I understand there's a potential flaw in that piece of software. So the lineage aspect is ultimately what prevents that kind of security context we're talking about, right? Because if I understand exactly the full uh, state of the supply chain that built a piece of software, I know so much about it, maybe I don't need to shift as much left to the developers, right? Maybe I can actually shift the relevant context to be able to say, because you built this application with this particular version of an open source, repo uh, open source project, and you built it with a certain pipeline in a particular way, we know that it doesn't just have a potential vulnerability, but a real risk to our organization. And I know all of that because what we did shift left was the responsibility for like accurate facts about software to the developers. That fundamentally creates a much better security experience, right? Than saying, we think this might be vulnerable, now fix it before any of your builds succeed. Because that requires context from the right that fundamentally can't be seen by those developers at the time. And then the third thing, and this gets a little bit to sort of future state here, right? But the idea of having declarative security testing as part of code. The same way that we can declare from an application's perspective how I want it to be packaged and what infrastructure I want and how I want it to behave in production. What if we can also declare here are the kinds of security testing I want to be done? And does the tooling uh, exist to do this at scale? No, it doesn't. But just like test-driven development, what's the number one rule? You write the test first. The test is going to fail until somebody comes along to write the code that supports it, right? But what we have right now is a sort of chicken and the egg problem. Uh, we have security testing that's making a bunch of assumptions about what developers are putting into their software. And we have developers who have no way to indicate the facts about that software in their application so that it can be tested better, right? So if we had an asset that sits inside a repository that says, this is my declarative security testing policy, my declarative threat model for this application, not only are we helping developers because we get those undifferentiated alerts off their plates, but we're helping out security because I now understand in a machine readable way, what are the potential risk uh, implications of this piece of software? All right, just got my time warning. I think we're gonna wrap it up there, but we've got a couple minutes left for questions. Anybody who maybe has implemented these kinds of shift left approaches, joys, sorrows, et cetera. Yeah. Can you give an example of um, context that lacks for security testing from the right? Uh, yeah, so where something is deployed for example, right? So let's say I'm building a container in an organization. Uh, it goes into a repository. Another team takes that container, builds something else on top of it. That goes to my most critical business asset in an environment that is internet facing, right? I don't know as the original developer what happens to it. Right? Um, things like vulnerable conditions are a part of it as well. So we think about log4shell. What do you need to be vulnerable to log4shell? Well, the typical answer is, oh, you need log4j 2.11 and you also need it to be internet facing, and it needs egress traffic on an LDAP port, and it needs to matter, right? It needs to go somewhere that's actually gonna cause business impact. So what I need to know as a developer is not, oh my God, fix that issue in every repository, but here's what to fix first based on the real risk that I can't understand until I get that context coming from the right. There was a question back here earlier. Yeah, you were uh, talking about CVSS, and so, mm -hmm. I mean, CVSS does have a, a well-defined way to define temporal and environmental factors, and so I always uh, have to call that out because people yep. seem to forget about it. Um, yeah, then I would say, though, what is the, uh, you know, how well do people understand that and how well is it integrated into tooling to be able to make automated decisions based on it? Um, and I know that CISA and others are doing a lot of work now around kind of machine-readable security advisories to inject a lot more of that context. Um, and again, saying this as a security vendor, I think most of these tools are really dumb in that they look at the score without 
Um, and and it's, it's often interpreted as a measure of risk rather than a measure of severity, right? And it was never intended to, but if that's the only kind of numeric value you have to say, oh my God, it's a nine, fix it now, what you're not looking at is, you know, what is the maturity level of exploit? What are the conditions required? What's the likelihood, et cetera? Anyone else? Okay. Um, if you have any other questions about kind of uh, shifting left, about uh, prioritization context, about application security in general, come over see us at the sneak uh, booth uh, and get a free pair of socks for putting your green uh, tag in the in the cup in the back. Um, thank you, everybody.